Well, welcome to the living rooms today and uh, to my Sunday sermon. And uh, it, it's amazing really to think that here we are at the end of August already. And it's harvest time and it's the harvest that is the thought behind uh, this series of messages that I'm giving. And we're studying in the book of Ruth. It's a love story with a plus. And uh, today is part two. And uh, I want us to think particularly about the wings of God. But uh, first of all, just to chat a little bit about the harvest. Um, v and I, as we are driving about the countryside here, uh, sometimes we'll, we'll have a bit of a competition to see who knows what crops are being grown in the fields that we're passing. I, I've got a slight advantage in that most of my life I've been involved with agriculture, <coughs> whereas V hasn't. But we're really blessed in this part of the northeast of Scotland with the, the, the farms being so fertile and uh, there's a huge variety of crops that are grown. There's uh, oilseed rape, there's wheat, there's barley, there's peas, there's broad beans, there's turnip, there's broccoli, and uh, I suppose there are other crops as well. But I, I've been into the fields today and uh, I, I cut some uh, crop for you and I, I brought them here to show you. Okay, and so these are two of the cereal crops that are grown in this area. I wonder if you can tell the difference. One is wheat and one is barley. Well, this one's the wheat one. And wheat, of course, is grown and uh, cut and, and the seed is milled and uh, used to produce flour from which we, we bake our bread and make our biscuits in this country. Very important crop. The other one here is barley. And the, the, the way you can really distinguish the barley from the wheat is that there are these ons that, that come from the ends of the seed that stick up. And uh, it's like somebody's hair standing in end. And uh, you've got to watch out with these because uh, they've, got, they've got little hooks on them. They can stick to your clothing. And if you get them in your mouth and your throat, particularly if you're working in the harvest uh, behind a combine, uh, as it's finally crushed into little pieces, it can get into your mouth uh, and it really sticks to your throat. And it's, it's extremely unpleasant. But barley is also an important crop for uh, feeding animals and uh, it's also widely used for the production of alcohol. So we are really thinking about the barley harvest time in the book of Ruth. That's the setting of the book of Ruth. And just really quickly to tell you the story so far, Naomi had just returned to her hometown of Bethlehem. And she's bitter because of the deaths of her husband and her two grown-up sons in a distant land, the land of Moab, where they had settled to escape the famine in the land of Israel. However, Naomi's daughter-in-law called Ruth had insisted on going back to Bethlehem with Naomi, although it was not her home country. Moab was her home country, and she insisted in going back with Naomi, really, I think, to care for her because of her strong love for her and also for her God. And that's where we pick up the story today in chapter two of the book of Ruth at Barley Harvest. But let's pray first. Father, we come to you and we thank you for your living word. And we thank you that it, it does speak to us in every single book of your word, the Bible. And so, Lord, as we come at this, our harvest time, to the, the, the book of the harvest, which is this little book of Ruth, we pray that you would help us to understand what you want to say into our hearts and our lives today. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Well, first of all, I'd like to read to you the verses that um, I'm going to be speaking from. <clears throat> and at home, if you've got a Bible, you might want to look up these verses as well. It's Ruth chapter 2 
and I'm going to read the first 12 verses. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabites said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favour. And Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, whose young woman is that? And the foreman replied, she is the Moabites who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. And she went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and go, don't go away from here. Stay here with my servants, girls. Watch the field where the, the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you, and whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this she bowed down with her face to the ground, and she exclaimed, Why have I found such favour in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? And Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law, since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And there we're going to stop and we're going to think about these verses right now. And so in chapter 2 we are introduced to an important new person in the story of Ruth and he's a close relative of Naomi's late husband, uh, a wealthy farmer. He's described as a man of standing. His name is Boaz and really in the town of Bethlehem he's recognised uh, as a leader uh, of the community, a, a man of outstanding character. And there are two things that really the Lord has, has spoken to me about from these first 12 verses of chapter 2 that we've read today. And the first thing is this. It's from verse number 3 that nothing happens by accident. And in verse 3 it says this, as it turned out, uh, Ruth found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz. Nothing happens by accident with God. Naomi had returned to Bethlehem destitute with nothing. They had gone out with a lot, with lots of hopes and lots of ambitions to the land of Moab. But things had gone so wrong and Naomi had returned to Bethlehem with nothing. And Ruth asks Naomi's uh, permission to go into the harvest fields to collect some of the grain that's left by, behind by the harvesters. And that was something that it was common to happen in these days. And there are three groups of people who are working in the harvest fields. You see, they didn't have these massive combines that we have today, which can cut and, and harvest uh, something like 20 acres per hour. It would take weeks to do 20 acres back in Ruth's day. But the men used to cut the barley crops with, with their, their long-handled knives or with their scythes. And then the young women would come behind them and they would tie uh, the, 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 the grain with the stalks into bundles, into sheaves. They would stack them. And then after that would come another group of people. They were the people who were 
destitute, they were very poor, who came into the fields to try and collect a few years of grain that had been left behind just so that they could survive. You see, there was no government support and no social security. And these poor people relied on the kindness of the farmers and the landowners, that they could have some of the, the little bits of grain that were left behind in the fields. And so think of the shame. Uh, and Ruth was one of those who were gathering up because that's all she would have to live on. And think of the shame of doing that. But Ruth went there and she was a hard worker and she hardly stopped from this back-breaking work. And as it turned out in verse 3, as it so happened, that Ruth chose to glean in the fields that belonged to Boaz. She hadn't known it was his field that she was going to uh, go to until he spoke to her. And he speaks kindly to her. And was it a coincidence that she ended up in his field? I don't think it was. I think it was because God had planned it that way so that Naomi and Ruth would be blessed and God's amazing purposes would be worked out in their lives. Learn to recognise that when you become a Christian and you begin to trust your Heavenly Father more and more, that events in your life will not just happen by chance. Really important principle from the Word of God. God is working in the background of our lives. He's speaking to us. He's shaping us. He's directing us. He's using us. He wants to bless us. And so yearn for and learn to see the God incidences in your life rather than the coincidences, the things that happen by chance in your life. And over the past 45 years or so, the lives of V and I have been full of God incidences. And it's really exciting when you see God at work in your life. These as it so happened moments that are so exciting and really fill you with joy. And now Ruth was having one of these moments, these God incidents moments. And the second thing to learn today, and this is the big lesson that's going to take a little bit of time to explain. Ruth, the pagan Moabitess woman, had come to shelter under God's wings in verse number 12. And Boaz says to Ruth, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. In other words, her kindness to Naomi. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So we're going to think about God's wings in three ways uh, today. The first one is this, that God has wings like hen's wings. Okay, you maybe think that's a bit odd, but that's what the Bible says. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 34, the Lord Jesus said this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I, I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her, wing, her chicks under her wings. But you would not. You were not willing. And so the picture that Jesus is, is painting is that, that he has come to be the Messiah of the nation of Israel. And he's come to the, the city of Jerusalem, that, that the center of the nation, the place of worship. Uh, and and he's, he's bringing the message of God, the good news of God's salvation. And he's calling people to himself as their Messiah. But they would not come. He wants them to come like a chick would, would cluck and, and, and call her chicks and the little chicks would come scurrying and they would shelter under the hen's wings. That's the picture that Jesus is using. He's saying, I'm the hen, you're the chicks. Come to me, shelter under my wings. I'm the son of God. I've come for you. I've come to save you and to bless you. 
And so God's wings are hen's wings of security, of shelter and salvation. Salvation in particular. Because that's the reason that Jesus came into the world. He came to be our saviour. To forgive us our sins. And to enable our sins to be forgiven, he would ultimately go and he would die on the cross and he would bear the judgment of the Father for the sins that we have committed. And to be saved, he invites us to come to him and to find shelter in him. And so uh, my question is this, are you saved? As you're listening to me today, are you saved? Are you born again? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour? Well, if not, why don't you humbly come to the cross of Jesus today and receive him as your saviour? Come and shelter under Jesus' wings. So God has wings like hen's wings. The second wings that uh, I thought of is this, that God has wings like eagle's wings. And in the Bible, God is described as being like an eagle, soaring, majestic, exalted, ruler of the universe, with eyes like an eagle that can see the minutest detail down below. That's something that distinguishes the eagle, that, that unique hunter that can focus on its prey uh, a, a mile or more away and target it and go and find it. And so God is described as being like an eagle, sovereign and majestic and high and lifted up. Exodus chapter 19 verse 4 says this, You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and carried you to myself. And the God of heaven, when his people were slaves in the land of Egypt, he saw them and he soared down and he rescued them and carried them away out of that land like as if they were carried in eagle's wings. It was miracle after miracle after miracle. He says, I carried you to myself. In Psalm 103 verse 5, the Lord satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. And one of the things that about eagles is that, uh, is that they, they soar. They soar in the heights, uh, catching the thermals, and it's just completely effortless for them. And they could probably soar there all day long. And that's the picture that's painted here in Psalm 103. The Lord satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 says, Those who hope in the Lord, and sometimes it's, it's translated, those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And so God's wings are eagles' wings of strength and satisfaction. And I want to ask you another question. Are you really soaring, running, enduring? Are you satisfied as a Christian? Have you found your rest really in God? Have you found your strength in him? Does he satisfy you uh, as, as you, you are his child and, and you have this amazing relationship with him? And as you trust him, does he really satisfy your soul? Does he satisfy your life? Well, if not, I would invite you to come to the God who is the majestic eagle. Well, finally and thirdly, we're going to think about the God who has wings like dove's wings. And in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 16, 
It says this, as soon as Jesus was baptized, and we're going right back here to the beginning of his three-year ministry, and he comes to the River Jordan and to John the Baptist, and he is baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. And as soon as he is baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that very moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Well, the dove is perhaps the gentlest and shyest of all birds. Very beautiful bird. Not to be compared with the, the pigeon that's so common nowadays. Uh, that some people would describe as the rat of the skies. A dove is completely different. It's beautiful, it's gentle, it's shy. It has these pure white feathers so fitting uh, to describe the Holy Spirit. Um, and God's wings are, are dove wings of the Holy Spirit. Such a fitting description. And at Jesus' baptism, heaven opened and Jesus, the Son of God, was filled by, he was led by, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit every moment of every day of his ministry, of his life. And then at Pentecost, after Jesus had died on the cross, and he'd risen from the dead and he had ascended back into heaven. At Pentecost, heaven opened once again and the risen Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to fill his followers and to fill his church. So today, my third question to you is this. Today, are you conscious of being filled, of being led, of being equipped, of being empowered? by the Holy Spirit? Do you want God to use you? Do you really want God to use you? For he does want to use you in far greater ways than you could ever imagine. Well, if you do, then invite the Holy Spirit to fill you today. So under God's wings, we are saved, we are satisfied, and we can be filled and equipped by the Holy Spirit. It's not for the favoured few, but for all who come humbly to the Lord Jesus and put their trust in him. Ruth, who once was a, an idol worshipper, humbly came to God and her life was transformed by the living God. It doesn't happen by chance. It's God's plan for all of us, but we need to be prepared to let him. So let's just come to God in prayer now. Father, we come to you and we thank you for your word that reminds us that, that you love us and you've got a plan for our lives. And your plan is that we might be saved from our sins, that we might be united with yourself through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in all that he did for us at the cross. And we thank you that, that you're a God who has great wings, the wings of a hen, the wings of an eagle, the wings of a dove. And so as we come to you, and wholeheartedly trust in you. And if we don't do that, Lord, would you forgive us? But may we wholeheartedly trust in you as the God who saves us, who raises up on us in wings like eagles, makes us the children of the King of Kings, that causes us to soar into the heavenly realms and believe that your word is right and true when it says we are seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. And you're really telling us that when we become uh, your children through following the Lord Jesus, we're very precious in your sight. 
and, and, and you teach us to see things from the heavenly realm, to see things far, far differently from the heavenly perspective. And you, you teach us and we learn to follow the ways of the kingdom of your dear son. And that's hard. It's difficult. And all, all, all of the world would be against us. And all of the power of, of Satan himself would be against us, having our lives transformed. But we thank you for your wonderful Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we would just ask that your spirit would fill, fill us. Every single one of us who's watching and listening today, would you come and you fill us? Would you find a resting in place in us, a place of peace where you find yourself at rest, the shy dove of the Holy Spirit? Would you come and fill us and change us and use us and make us more like Jesus? This is our prayer today, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Well, thanks once again for being with me and uh, listening to part two of Ruth's story. And uh, we'll continue again, God willing, uh, next Sunday. As always, uh, I'll give you my contact details. If you want to get in touch with me, I'd love that, uh, just to be able to help you or to uh, give you more information. And I can be contacted through our website, which is www.thelivingrooms.org. Well, goodbye and God bless you.